right. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the mini symposium on systems biology here at JuliaCon. Uh, yesterday, we already had a nice discussion on community needs, plans, and visions. And I think the key themes that came out of this discussion were essentially that um, we can um, also work on model composability. Units was a theme um, that, we could, that we could work on and also matching different granularities when composing models. And another thing we discussed was the documentation of the systems biology toolboxes. And um, some people don't find them very easy to understand yet, which is why I would like um, to point you to the SciML SysBio Slack channel. So if you have any question, then this is a place where you can go ahead, ask this question, and maybe afterwards, once, you, once everything becomes more clear, you can also create a PR to improve the docs. Yes, Chris. And if you, have any, uh, if you want any documentation improvements, you have to say which package and which page. There's like a thousand pages, so improve the docs means nothing. Which package, which page, and what did you have issues uh, uh, doing? Like, well, we love to fix these things, but we need that information. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess that's a that's great way to go, and of course, like maybe you already know the fix, and then you can create a PR. So the other thing I wanted to point you to is our um, SysBio community call. We are planning in, on a regular basis to, to have calls for the community to discuss exactly the things that we discussed yesterday and that we will discuss today. So please scan the QR code and sign up and you should receive an email at some point when we um, get this thing going. So the plan for today essentially, slide is not switching it. Uh -huh. Well, so the plan for today essentially is um, that we have, that we split the session in three parts. Um, First session will take roughly an hour, then we have a five minute break, then we have another hour, then we have um, lunch time, and after lunch we reconvene again for the third session. So, yeah, with that, um, I would like to welcome the first speaker, which is Alex Cohen, if I'm correct. Yes, so please join me in welcoming Alex Cohen. I have the slide, yeah. If you want to move, you can take this. Oh, I see. I see. <clears throat> uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to meet everyone. So, so this talk isn't about a specific package, but uh, I'm going to talk about uh, methods that we've been working on to study um, animal behavior, and we're interested in, and we have a lot of this like coded up, but it, but we haven't uh, uh, started work on like an official package yet. But we're definitely interested in doing that, and and would like any help um, that uh, that people could offer. Um, and hopefully, this title will will make sense towards the end. But uh, generally. So, but, but generally, this will be about quantifying behavioral states. Um, so this is important uh, uh, to study animal behavior and also to, to uh, when people study how um, like underlying neural mechanisms give rise to, to larger scale uh, animal behavior. It's important to be able to quantify uh, what behavior means. Um, and in the past, mode decompositions have been used to, to study animal behavior. So uh, a popular example of that in C. elegans is, um, and that's mostly what I'll focus on today, is um, the idea of eigenworms. So basically in this 2008 paper, they decomposed the shape of a worm in terms of the first four principal, principal components, and they used the, the coefficients of those principal component vectors to, to cluster and identify different, um, different behavioral states in the animal. 
So this project is a collaboration uh, with people in the uh, Brain and Cognitive Science Department, uh, Professor Steve Flavel at MIT. Um, and basically the data we're working with comes from this microscope setup on the left uh, where they can uh, take videos of uh, worms freely moving around and they provide us with uh, a video on the right which is just the center line position of, of the worm over time. Um, so, so yeah, so we s wanted to use mode decompositions to study uh, these behavioral states. Um, but instead of using principal component modes, we wanted to use a generalized basis um, that you can use for, for any animal uh, in any behavioral state. So what we do is we take the uh, position of the worm along, the arc, along its arc length and in time, and we uh, decompose it into the shape modes. Uh, here we're using Chebyshev polynomials, uh, where the coefficients are going to depend on time. Um, and so these polynomials are shown on the left, and you can see from the, from the middle and right plots that we're able to, to achieve good reconstruction error um, with a relatively small number of modes. Um, and also that these coefficients, these mode coefficients are physically interpretable. So if you look at the transformations to, to compute them, you see that the zeroth order one uh, looks to be just a weighted center of mass, and then the, the first order one is basically an average orientation, um, and also the frequencies of oscillations of these coefficients uh, closely matches with, with the speed of the worm. Um, so, so our idea is going to be to try to learn models for uh, how these coefficients change in time and to use those models to identify and study behavioral states. Um, so the way we do that is we just postulated to, to do the simplest thing we could, we could think of, to just postulate a, a simple first order uh, linear dynamics uh, between these coefficients. Um, and you get a model that looks like this when you don't impose any physical constraints on, on your system. Um, when you impose that the system should be translationally invariant, then um, you get a slightly simpler model. And the thing that I, you know, one of the most important things about this talk that I won't really go into the details of uh, for, for time constraints is that uh, the, the final constraint that we incorporate is this length constraint. Um, basically saying that the length of the worm doesn't change in time, uh, which, which is true for the, the time scales that we're interested in studying. And when you do this, uh, you basically get what looks like a Schrodinger equation for your mode coefficients, uh, where you have a uh, Hamiltonian H um, that has, I mean, a symmetric and anti-symmetric part um, that encode turning in, in straight motion. Uh, respectively, basically, because the symmetric part allows your x and y modes to couple and your anti-symmetric part uh, doesn't. Um, so, so our idea is to try to, uh, from a set of data, learn what these Hamiltonian matrices are and then use those to, to uh, identify behavior. Um, and uh, so the methods we use to do this um, are we, we decompose uh, the, this Hermitian matrix um, into um, you know, this product, um, and then we can constrain uh, the lambdas uh, to be the uh, oscillation frequencies that we can just get directly from the data set, and then um, we can uh, parameterize this unitary matrix as a product of householder matrices, um, where all we need to, to learn from the data are these uh, of vectors uh, that define each uh, uh, householder matrix. Um, and then we do this by using uh, differential equations.jl and uh, just the simple forward mode automatic, automatic differentiation uh, to get these PN vectors. Um, so just to see what this looks like, uh, here's an example of, of an anti-symmetric part of, of the uh, Hamiltonian for, for a worm. Uh, and you can see that so the dots are the experiments and the line are, are the simulated model um, that you get pretty good fits. Uh, and we wanted to apply this to other systems as well. So it, it was super easy using images.jl to get 
data for, for many other systems. So here is a, uh, that's a toy snake that I bought on Amazon. And then uh, you can just, uh, you know, convert to black and white, binarize, get the center line. And then this final video is a center line overlaid on top. Uh, there. And then you get the same data that I showed earlier for the worm, which is just the center line uh, moving in space. Uh, so you can do this. Uh, so for the toy snake, we also have a video of a real snake um, from a paper in 2019, and then a simulation of, of C. elegans um, from, a, from a different paper. And you can do the same process and get good fits of these uh, uh, Hamiltonians. And so I also won't go into the details here, but we developed a method to basically uh, cluster these matrices um, to get, you know, essentially like a phase diagram of, um, of these different types of undulatory locomotion. Uh, and you can see that uh, they cluster pretty well between the different animals and that there's a pretty strong overlap between the war model and the actual uh, C. elegans videos. Um, so this hasn't really been about behavioral states so far, mostly about um, classifying different types of locomotion. But so the, the way we um, decided to look at behavioral states is to say, is to make these uh, Hamiltonian matrices time varying and perform inference on these time varying matrices um, with the idea being that the worm state changes in time and um, uh, there might be slow and rapid transitions between states um, and slow transitions, you know, um, in, in the rapid transitions might be a way of identifying uh, transitions in actual behavioral state of the animals. Um, and, and we can use this idea from quantum mechanics of the adiabatic theorem, uh, which basically studies slow varying uh, Hamiltonians in, in quantum systems. Uh, so the inference is, is the same, but now uh, these PN vectors um, are going to be time varying, so you, you need a way to parameterize them in time. Um, but uh, other than that, the, the, the same methods apply for how we learn these PN vectors. Um, so what this looks like for the, for the worm data, so the, so the, the red dots are going to be experiments and the black line is going to be the uh, the fitted model, um, and so the the two plots up here are just showing the fits, and then here are going to be the, the SNA, or basically the Hamiltonian that will vary in time, and then um, we computed this quantity that, that I won't get into called the, the Berry phase, uh, which is a measure, kind of a measure of how adiabatic um, the motion is, and, and that's going to be plotted down here. Um, so it looks like this. So here it's just moving uh, in a you know, consistent straight motion. And then as it starts to turn, you basically see rapid variations in the Hamiltonians. And you see these spikes in, in the Berry phases down there as it enters a turn. And then, uh, and then it returns back to the straight motion. Uh, and it might be a bit easier to see in, in this plot. Um, but uh, you can see up, oops, up here. As it starts to, uh, as it starts to turn, you see this symmetric part of the Hamiltonian uh, turn on, if you will, uh, which, as I showed before, was indicating the turning motion, and then, um, and you can also see that in the, the uh, these plots of the Frobenius norm of of S and A, um, and then also as it enters a turn, uh, you see um, the geometric phase and also the error in the adiabatic approximation start to increase. Uh, yeah, so these are, um, that, that's pretty much all I have, but um, uh, we're hoping to, to make a package for, for using these mode decompositions to study uh, behavioral states. Um, and, and we have a paper on it, and, and we're working on you know, writing an official package now. Thanks a lot, Alex. Um
Does it work now? Yeah, Chris. Yeah, so the, a lot of the equations that you're solving in a very specific structural form, right? Oh, I should do this for the video. Yeah. So a lot of the equations that you're solving had a very specific structural form, right? They were uh, time-dependent linear operators multiplying yeah. by your up. Did you try any of the specific oper uh, solvers for that uh, kind of stuff, like things like the Magnus integrators and uh, and the 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 other ones that are all in that like you know non-autonomous linear operator kind of kind of piece, or did you stick to the to the mainline integrators? Um, so for uh, so in the end, we, we basically ended up writing our own. Because, so for the, like, for the multiplication by the householder matrices, so they're the fast multiplications for that. So we kind of wrote our own implementations um, to make that fast. And then, um, yeah, I mean, we, we just used like a simple like Euler time stepping. So nothing too complicated there. Um, and it was fast enough for our purposes. but. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you think this is a better way to do it, yeah, <laughs> I'd be happy to talk well, to you. Well, I'd be interested to find if there's a way to generalize it. Because, yeah, I mean, that definitely has a lot of special tricks yeah. that could go on with yeah. it, right? Like, I think the thing that'd be interesting to see if we could pull some of those tricks out to reusable packages there. Yeah. Uh, so you have, like, a nice model for how, like, the worm moves. Uh, is there any, like, pl like, especially on the biological side, like, what kind of biological questions do you think you'll be able to answer given this model? Yeah, so we're hoping, uh, so the, the main questions that we're interested in is how uh, like neural firing patterns manifest behaviors, behavioral states. Um, so basically, um, the, the lab we're working with, in addition to just getting these movies of the worm moving around, can also simultaneously record neural firing patterns. So what we're working on now is trying to integrate um, basically like uh, activity patterns of individual neurons into uh, the model we have. So maybe as like a control um, part of it um, or, or something like that. But, but those are the ideas that, those are like bi the biological ideas uh, that we're looking into. All right, uh, thanks a lot, Alex.